this is John Robb here talking to John Duran, uh, the editor of The Quietus, and also an author, about his obsession with penguin paperbacks. Is it just the paperbacks or is it anything to do with penguin? Um, I love the design. It's called a colophon. Um, and there's been loads of them, but, you know, yeah. like I love that little design of the penguin, but it's not really about that. Like penguin have been going for years and like, you know, I've got a bunch of more modern penguins, but I think they're ugly and they, but they're in a room upstairs. You know what I mean? It's very specifically about the penguins that came out just before uh, the, the second world war up to about the start of the seventies. And for me, it just kind of ticks a load of different boxes of things that I'm interested in class politics uh modernist literature um design and also kind of like kind of cult stuff you know you might look um in a secondhand bookshop and see something that's mass produced like a penguin and think oh well that can't be cult it can't be underground but you know i've those black titles up there they're all jg ballard um, I've got a stack of books by M.R. James and Arthur Macken. They may have been mass produced and they may have been seen as almost being like pop culture when they came out. But like by the time the fall were going on about stuff like Arthur Macken and M.R. James, who knew about it? No one. And these kind of secondhand books would be the places where you found out about them. You know, it's only really through people picking up like these old penguin paperbacks getting obsessed with them that they'd eventually kind of come back into print and come back into fashion um i'll tell you briefly why i collect them i'm not sure i fully know myself but what happened was i became a dad for the first time after i turned 40 and i think the first family holiday we had it was to Tenby in Wales, absolutely beautiful seaside town. I love it there. It's like one of my happy places or whatever. And I went into um, an old school bookshop, you know, nothing's in order. There's just piles of books from the floor to the ceiling, an absolute jumble. And I was looking through and I found this book there, um, Selected Essays by George Orwell. And it was 50p, and it just hit me like a lightning bolt. It's like, like I'm a dad now. Like, I need to sort of, like, save up money. I, I need to be less of a spendthrift, you know what I mean? And, like, my big cultural collecting thing before then was probably vinyl records, but they cost a lot of money, you know what I mean? And I was like, I could build up, like, a small library of these books for, for what, you know, the price of a couple of Mars bars a week or whatever. And actually, they're kind of beautiful to look at. And it was more through buying that book. And then it would be like every time I went on holiday or every time I went uh, out of London to do a job, I'd be, where's the bookshop? Instead of where's the record shop, where's the bookshop? And that'd be like almost the first thing I'd do, go in, where are the penguins, have a look. And... So the collection started first, and it was only really after starting to collect that I almost kind of back-projected a kind of reason onto it. And it, it was only after I had a pile in the corner that I started reading about why Penguin Books had been set up and why it was important for the working class of the UK. So, so why, actually, well, I need to know why. What is this aesthetic of Penguin? Obviously, it's got them. A- the beautiful covers and the artwork but when he's originally set up was it was it for getting interesting esoteric ideas to the people was that was that the original idea of it sort of yeah so I'll, I'll hit you with the potted history of it like there's a guy called alan lane and he left school at the age of 16 and he went to work in a struggling bookshop called bodley head in london in 1919 and that was run by his uncle, who was like essentially a working class farm lad made good, as far as I know. And, you know, so straight away, we're talking about people who aren't the elite. You know, none of them have been to Eton or even university, but they've been book people their whole lives. 
anyway, uh, Alan Lane, as he started to kind of get older and he worked his way up from the bottom of this kind of company and the board of directors didn't trust him or really like his vision. Like he, um, he was like the first person to put out Ulysses by James Joyce in paperback. So he's kind of a radical really, you know, but in 1934, he went to visit one of their authors, Agatha Christie, and she lived in Exeter. And he noticed that at Exeter train station, he was like, I want to buy a book and read it on the train. And um, he just noticed that all he could get was garbage, bad newspapers, bad magazines, and really, really bad quality paperback, um, but like pulp novels, but not good pulp novels, just kind of trash or whatever. And he had a four hour train journey. And in that four hour train journey, he came up with the entire idea for Penguin Books. So he launched it the next year. And what he was doing really was launching a, he was launching a brand. Do you know what I mean? So this whole idea of like, first of all, in the 1930s, Paperback books were sneered at, spat upon. They were just seen as the lowest of the low. You know, you're like only idiots read paperback books. So the idea that you could put really good literature into um, paperback books and sell them was like a really radical idea. And also, like it seems odd now, but in 1934, the idea that uh, working class people wanted to read anything that wasn't trash was a really, really radical new idea. And so, like, uh, Alan Lane took a gamble on this idea, saying, like, we're going to do it. We're going to put out uh, books, but they're going to cost the same as a packet of cigarettes, so six pence. And, you know, so, like, you, there's really no excuse. You know, if you want to buy a book, uh, you can do. Anyone can. So... All of the books came out in this kind of, they call it a tri-band. Uh, there was no artwork and they were colour coded, you know, so you've got kind of international politics, you've got plays, you've got kind of uh, crime and science fiction were in green. Eventually they started doing nature writing in yellow. Um, and you get these really beautiful kind of like current affairs books in grey. And it was a massive gamble. There's something very, I was thinking about this this morning because I know I was going to be talking to you and I think there's something quite punk rock or post-punk about it. Mm. Um, you, you, you know, everything about it was kind of radical, it was very class driven, but it was a huge gamble. Um, they bought their first 10 titles from Jonathan Coe of huge international publishers. And Jonathan Coe, quite snidely, saw that they were on the bones of their arse. The parent bookshop was just about to go bankrupt. They had no money. And, that, and they have admitted since they sold them 10 titles in order just to suck up 400 quid off them before they went bankrupt. So they launched with four titles. And it was, it was kind of lunacy, you know. You, like most books, most paperback books would sell, I think it was like an average of something like 3,000 copies. Um, but they wanted to keep the price down so low that in order to turn a profit, they would have to sell 25,000 copies of each book they published. But they only had enough money to publish 20,000 of each copy. So it's almost like the Blue Monday kind of 12-inch thing. There was, in the first instance, there was literally no way they could make any money. They could only lose money doing it. And the secret was, I think Alan Le Lane realized that, that working class people wanted to read, but they were put off by big old school libraries and they were put off by big old, especially put off by big old school bookshops. And he had the idea of like, you take your books to places like um, chemists, you take your books to somewhere like Woolworths. And true enough, they printed these 10 titles they took them around to Woolworths and like within a week Woolworths had um, sold out of everything and they said give us another 65,000 books and like within a year they'd sold let me get this right 
they'd sold three million copies of 50 books. And it's, it's like, like a revolutionary thing that happened. And yeah, totally, you know, that Mannix line, which, in, you know, they're just... Um, Libraries give us power. Or... Exactly. But so did Penguins. Yeah. So did Penguin books, you know. So, like, again, like, I mean, I'm kind of projecting backwards. It's not why I got into it, but, like, the more I get into it, the more I feel enthused about this kind of subject. Is so... It, in a sense, that, that matches what you do with the quietus, doesn't it? I wish. <laughs> I wish it was that well thought out. I wish it was that stylish. You know, I wish it was that financially <laughs> successful. But, yeah, you know, like, in a very, very small... Uh, very very small way you know I, I i definitely can say that i find uh penguin books uh inspirational and i love the idea of um uh complex ideas being transmitted in easy to understand terms to a very wide audience you know what i mean and i hate i hate barriers to learning that are put in place unnecessarily you know yeah, um, I, I, I see sort of like penguin books. And like I say, there's a wealth of radical history, a radical politics. There's a wealth of interest in history. There's a wealth of groundbreaking design. There's a wealth of thrilling genre fiction. There's a wealth of world beating um, literature. All of it just in a really small space, just behind my head. And like none of it's been obfuscated by kind of critical theory or or like the, the idea that you have to have like, you know, a PhD and whatever to understand it, you know. Um, here's another thing. Um, I've noticed in lockdown, a lot of people, probably our age, John, um, like critics, <laughs> um, moaning about what people choose to have behind them in these kind of Zoom conversations. And they're all mocking like, you know, oh, look at, look at so-and-so showing off their book collection or showing off their record collection. And it's like, fuck you. You know what I mean? You're a critic. This is what's wrong with criticism. Like if, like, why shouldn't, why aren't you proud of what you're into? Mm. Why aren't you proud of what inspires you? And this, so again, these books kind of symbolize something. If you want to call me pretentious and if you want to laugh at me because I kind of collect these books, then go ahead. I'm absolutely fine with that. But it's much better to me than being sat in front of a wall that's painted magnolia. You know what I mean? Like this um, one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my books are over there. It's just the lights. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> uh, when you speak to uh, Kronos, by the way, from Venom, the founding father of Venom, he has a large skull and crossbones flag behind him with the words Venom in Gothic script over it. And he almost looks like one of these ISIS guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think that's like, I, I think there's something really proper about that. Yeah, um, but I'm, I'm going to stick with yeah. Penguins. So who are the key authors, would you say? I mean, not, you mentioned people like Mach Arthur mentioned before, but you know, the authors who made the most impact that came via Penguin. Would it be George Orwell or... Uh, so for Penguin, like I think like George Orwell typifies in a lot of people's minds, George Orwell wrote uh, reflexively about writing and reading. So, you know, he's a very good fit for Penguin books. And I've got like, I've got a million different copies of 1984 with all the different covers. And but I'm more into Orwell's essays and even some of them. I don't, I don't believe in them. I don't follow them. Although I think that every writer should be forced to digest the kind of politics in the English language because I think it's like a foundational text on how to write. Um, but the first real success story, oddly enough, um, for them was this edition of the Odyssey. And you had like a, the guy who translated it, he, uh, he's called uh, Ruhr. He was a fire warden during the Second World War. And to keep himself sane whilst he was stood on the car, I think he was stood, I think his watch was the roof of the Bodleian Library, right? And he was there like 
if, if anything goes on fire around here, I'm going to be reporting it to the police, so they can, uh, to the fire um, brigade, so they can put out the fires or whatever. To keep himself sane and to entertain his family, he translated um, Homer's The Odyssey. Now, he was like, I, th I, think his, I think his take was, there's something a little bit kind of too academic and too literal about the pre where the previous... Uh, kind of texts have been in, uh, um, like um, translated, and during um, between the First World War and the Second World War, there had been no less than eight translations of the Odyssey, and none had sold more than three thousand copies. It was definitely something that only people in academia and only people who studied the classics were interested in this. So then this guy, who's essentially like, you know, he was a writer, but essentially he was what? You know, when he was writing this, he was a fireman, you know, and uh, he did this for his own entertainment and the entertainment of his wife. And she said to him, look, you've got to get this published. So she took it, he took it under duress, because his wife had been given a load of grief about it. He took it to Al, uh, Alan Lane, who set up Penguin Classics, that version went on to sell three million copies. Again, it's like a revolutionary thing. And you would have been surrounded, like, you know all these people who are on the internet now saying, like, giving you all of these really long reasons about why they shouldn't wear a mask and stuff like that. They, they, these kind of cretins have always been with us, haven't they? And you can only imagine that before they took a gamble on pu putting out this kind of issue of the Odyssey, that literally everyone in academia would have said there is no market for working class people and lower class middle people, uh, lower middle class people as well. There is no market for these people, these working people, to be reading classic literature. Mm. Three million copies, you know what I mean? So that was a really big one. Um, I'm trying to think. What else? You had some, you had stuff like this. Once they started doing, um, once they started doing current affairs, um, the New Yorker, a year after the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in August of 1945, they sent this guy John Hersey um, over to Hiroshima, and he spent a while there just interviewing people. And they, the New Yorker took the kind of quite bold decision of just dedicating an entire issue just to this one story. And Penguin put it out and it just sold so many copies and it's such an incendiary, should have chosen my words better than that. It's just such a, a, an amazing piece of uh, journalism and it still sings out now. And I do think it's important because next month is the 75th anniversary of like the stuff going off in Hiroshima and you think you know all about it until you're reading through this and on every other page there's like this a little detail like um the scores of female burns victims who had floral patterns burnt into their skin because of the different shades of color on the kimonos you know and like I still this this like seventy you know seventy four years later still sings out loud you know um, big authors the really big one and I thought I'd left a oh here it is this one <laughs> because the English public just couldn't get enough descriptions of a gardener's erection <laughs> you know and it's all right up there. No fine isn't it. <laughs> That was the that was the big one, and again, you know, it's like it's like I can mock about it. It's like whatever, whatever. I'm not really a huge fan of Lawrence. It's an interesting book. It's the history. It's one of those things that it's like I don't like it because it's this is the literary equivalent of um, um, of a stock footage of bin bags piling up in the streets in 1976, <laughs> and then somebody going over the top of it. And then prog rock was over, you know. This, this, I mean, this is the thing that's always on the documentaries, isn't it? But I mean, I guess that's quite a notable one. But that's not why I get them. Why I get them is like occasionally I'll come across a book like this mm -hmm. where you just think, I hate spiders. I, I really, really don't like them. But just look at that. Oh, it's just wow. beautiful, isn't it? And you just find these in charity shops for like, like a quid or whatever, you know. So, was did Penguin drive the change? 
in you know bringing these ideas to people or, or was culture changing after maybe the first world war that people were expanding or was it both um so i i mean the way that i see it is is that like educational standards had improved um there was a definite desire there but penguin came in and filled it but and then some but they didn't just innovate i think that i think the reason why you've got to hand it to penguin is they didn't just innovate once they could have just innovated once right they could have been the people who put a copy of um you, you, you know like they could have been the people who put this in every working class and middle class um kind of like drawing room or whatever, they could have been the people who introduced literally millions of people to kind of classic literature all the way through this country. But they didn't stop there. Alan Lane, like a few, just a few years after they launched, um, he was at another train station, obviously where all of his great ideas came from, was just standing around waiting for trains. And in the queue for the kind of news agents or whatever, the concession stand, uh, in front of him, there was a, like a woman who said, do you have any pelicans? And she clearly made a mistake. She clearly meant to say um, penguins. And he was thinking, oh, like what if somebody comes along and um, sets up pen like pelican books as a, like, and he was probably feeling guilty. I'll tell you why. He took a lot of inspiration from the Albatross range of books. And they did the color coding. They've got the really nice color font of the bird and stuff like that. So he lent quite heavily on what Albatross were already doing. <laughs> so he went and talked to his lawyers and they said, look, there's one really good way for you to stop people from producing a series of books named after birds, just do it yourself. Hence, pelicans mm. and for kids, puffins. You can get, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you should see, there are collector's groups for these online, and when they see this video, like, I'll be persona non grower. I'm not, like, a proper collector compared to these, but you have people who've got all of them. It's <laughs> crazy, right? Um, there are strands of book out there, there are imprints, I should say, out there, that I've never even seen them. There's one called Peacock. There's one called Peregrines, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of them. They kept on diversifying and diversifying. So I think, I think the thing that where Penguin really should be applauded is for not stopping with literature, but saying, all right, you know what? So we've introduced a lot of people to like Virginia Woolf and James Joyce or whatever, but is there any good reason why we can't introduce the same people to cutting edge ideas in science, uh, astronomy, um, uh, physics, uh, international relations and all this stuff. So that's the kind of the Pelican stuff. And these books, I think these are almost like the more radical things, you know. So what happened in about 1970? Did they just lose quality control or? I, 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 yeah, I've got to be totally honest here and say I just don't like the look, I don't like the look of them, especially when it goes into the 80s. Like, this paper, it's kind of quite cheap, but they feel good and they look good. And then there's probably something to be said for once you get into the 80s, you know, you've got like a much shinier, harder cover, but they just look, they don't look good, you know what I mean? And again... Don't get me wrong, like I've got some of these books, but this they occupy a different space in my head to these, you know. Yeah. Um, there's another thing I should mention here, I guess, and it is, it's important to me at least, which is I already had a small collection of these when I was um, younger. And when I was 18, I went away to university and I was like the first person in my family to go to university and I'm I, I made a pig's ear of it I messed it up completely I was already like a chronic alcoholic I never went to any lectures um I never went to I never went in once and it took them it took them a year and a half to kick me off the course even though they'd never seen me or, or whatever but in that time you know like I had a 
like an auntie, my dad's elder sister, who helped raise him or whatever. And she was like a really influential person on me. And she used to go and scour like the secondhand bookshops of Liverpool for stuff off my reading list. And she'd come and visit me with a sack of like penguin books or whatever. So just before everything properly went pear shaped for me when I was 19, I had a ton of these books. And probably I lost them, maybe the, probably the, like the first time I became homeless or whatever, which wasn't for long, but it's, you know, it's long enough for you to lose everything, your, your comics, your books, your, most of your records, that sort of thing. So, you know, I associate in some sort of way these spines with the only mistake I've made in my life that I really lose sleep over, which is not really getting a formal kind of education. And it's kind of important for me, for my, uh, uh, I, it feels important for me to kind of own these books and to read them as well, you know, like, and it's something I neglected to do because, because of, because of Thunderbird and Amphetamines. <laughs> <laughs> good name for a uh, book so so is there a future for penguin or is it um is it a snapshot of a of a different time well i mean like you know it's like penguin is a is like penguin as an organization it's like a huge deal it's like a huge publishing house and like i don't i don't know much about what it's about these days but i buy their books as i'm sure you you do and like like everyone does but there is something very special about this kind of demarcated area for me. Like Maria, my partner, <laughs> she she I, like she put some of the new penguins in with these when we first moved into this house, and I, I didn't throw a fit about it. But I was I couldn't get comfortable till I removed them and put them somewhere else. There's something very very separate about these books. It isn't. I've got like, I've got to be really really clear about this. It's not just about reading. I log all of these on the internet and that's been good for me because I've come into contact with two or three other penguin collectors who are really kind of cool people. There's a guy called Tom Robinson who, uh, for example, sent me a load of the sci-fi books. These sci-fi books. Right, look at these covers. Oh, these covers are absolutely beautiful. I think they're worth a few quid as well. So, like, fair play to Tom, you know. He Got sent me one or two of it. Yeah. <laughs> they're so nice, do you know what I mean? And so, like, occasionally, you know, and, and like, and then, okay, and like, Andrew, who's producing this uh, chat of us, like, he he's brilliant because, like, you know, he's up in Scotland and he'll be in a bookshop and he'll be like, I've just got you this and send it to you through the post. So you're almost like you're having this almost old school sort of like postal conversation with people, you know. And I've got a bunch of duplicates here, which I in turn will offer to other people, you know. Um, then there's the negative side of being on the internet, which is like, it's kind of stopped now because I was a bit robust in my response to this. But I'd have people, I'd like log about 10 books and you'd have some pearl clutching twat. Um, going, oh, I hope you're going to read all of them. <laughs> I'm like, well, not necessarily. One, what makes it any of your fucking business? <laughs> Two, no, I, it's not just about reading. And like, you know, you, um, you, know you, you should approach your own priorities differently, I think. The idea that you just have to immediately buy, uh, immediately read every single book you buy and that's literally the only reason, the only legitimate reason there is for buying books. Like, there's one, there's a, there's a social aspect to this. Two, there is the very existential threat being posed to second-hand bookshops. Um, you know, I don't buy any of these online. It would be easy for me to have a much nicer, and much bigger collection if I just went onto Amazon, but I don't. I make a point of going to brick-and-mortar bookshops. A lot of them support charities. You know, one of the best second-hand bookshops you could go to is the Amnesty Bookshop in um, Hammersmith in London, and it has a penguin section. And it's like, for me, it's, you know, speaking to somebody with, like, addiction 
issues it's like it's a it's, it's a weird zone for me to be in. i will walk out just like laden down with all these amazing books or whatever and some of them i want to have this completely straight i've got no interest in reading them <clears throat> whatsoever i buy them because they've got good covers and I feel absolutely zero percent shame about that you know the works of art it is just like like collecting secondhand books it's not not just that it's a, a victimless crime it's the fact that it does good you know <laughs> mm. well yeah but you you don't have to have a legitimate reason for buying anything I mean if they look good piled up that's a legitimate reason isn't it yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, for me, it splits down into, like I said, I was a bit robust in the way I spoke to these people, so no one ever says it to me anymore. But it probably, it cleaves a number of different ways. Uh, for me, there's the stuff that I mentioned, there are books that I read as a teenager, as a very, very serious um, kind of teenager who was into post-punk and modernism. Um, they're all the kind of like Albert Camus books um, and stuff like that, which I probably don't need to read again. I've kind of read the ink off them already, but it's nice to have like really nice editions of them. Then there are books that I'm reading currently. I read Hiroshima yesterday. You know, it's, it's a short book. You can read it in one sitting. There are books which um, I will get round to reading. I'm sure of it. If I'm lucky enough that, you know, um, that I kind of, like, I'm still kind of, I've got this plan. If I'm lucky enough that I've got a roof over my head and I'm still cognitively quite with it by the time I hit 70, I'm just going to stop doing everything. I'm just going to lie on the to I'm going to lie on the sofa, I'm going to eat cheese on toast, and I'm going to read 2000 AD, and I'm going to read this stack of books behind me. That's what my plan is, you know. And am I going to read all of them? Probably not. I'm going to get to the age of 70 and think, what, I'm going to read all of the Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky? I don't think so. But I'll probably read all of these sci-fi books, you know. So, yeah, there's all sorts of different reasons why you could have these books. I mean, if you look at some of the pelicans, like, I wouldn't want to be getting my information on, on physics or, 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 you know, breakthroughs in science technology from a book that was pr published in the 1950s. It's got a nice cover. You know, that's why I've got it. Here's an interesting little turnaround. As an editor of an online digital media, would you read a Penguin book, uh, online digital book format only? Or would you have to have the paper? Would you have to have the cover? Um, I would do. Like, where's it gone? Uh, I would. Uh, oh, yeah. So this book, you're probably struggling to see it there. Like, I kind of wish I'd done that with, I read, um, every year I, I, I try and read one um, big statement book. Just get it out of the way and then it's like, like it's you know, like a few years ago I read, I read Moby Dick. I tried to read Ulysses last year, like for the third time, failed again. You just can't get through it. So this year it was like, I'm going to read Tin Drum by Gunter Grass. And I just, just, I just bullied my way through it. It's great. It's really funny. It's a great book or whatever. But I, but I had a mint condition copy of it, and I've absolutely destroyed it reading it. I mean, that's the thing. These books are there to be read. They're not, they're not that much of a collection that I don't mind them getting battered. But now I'm thinking I need to get out there and get another perfect gold spine gun to grass. Maybe I should have read it on a tablet or something. I've, I've got a tablet, but to be, to be honest, and I'm not. I'm not one of these people who's going to be like, oh, it has to be uh, the printed page or, oh, I'm totally modern, so, like, everything I read has to be on a tablet. I'm just, like, I'm just disorganised. Like, so I forget that my tablet's there. I forget to charge it up. My books, uh, my books are always there, and I can just pick one up and read it. I'll tell you what, right, um, I, I, I've kind of stopped now because of my hearing and lockdown and moving out of London, but I used to kind of, like, semi-regularly go out and DJ and I'd be always like some of the nights that we did were they were so amazing you know what I mean like people bouncing off the, the walls like everyone up dancing uh, and then other nights it just it just didn't click and something had gone wrong and, and it's kind of embarrassing really I didn't feel usually like one thing or the other and I was like what is there something 
is there, a, is there something I can learn from this? And I felt that more often than not, the bad nights were when I only had a laptop that had um, 20,000 songs on it, rather than just two crates of vinyl that probably had 80 records. And it would always be on the 80 record vinyl nights where things really popped off. And I think I'm just of that, I'm just of that mindset where if I can see the physical things in front of me, I can make better decisions. Whereas if I'm just having to look at a computer screen and think, right, what do I want to do now? I don't see all the options that some people see. I just get kind of confused. But having actual physical things in front of me, I think it's a real cognitive tool. Anyway. Mm, I totally understand that. That makes sense. Well, John, that's a really fantastic guide to uh, penguins for the Obsession series. So uh, thanks for that. So. <laughs>